right. Hey, good morning, church. Good to see you all this morning. Hey, I know now for some of you, it's been quite a week, right? So some have been laughing and some have been crying. I get that. I get that, right? And, and here's me this morning. I'm going to speak on choosing joy. <laughs> and by the looks of it, I'm going to have my work cut out for me today. I want you to know that this sermon topic was decided two months ago. God knew you would need this today, right? <laughs> and as I was looking through uh, the responses of, of different people about everything going on this past week, you know, I came across something that I thought might encourage you. And it starts off, you know it's going to be a bad day when, all right? Then I've got some things that you may or may not be able to relate to. So allow me to just share these to you, and maybe it'll put a smile on your face at least. <laughs> your situation might not be as bad as these folks. So, you know it's going to be a bad day when your twin sister forgets your birthday. Yeah, <laughs> that's a bummer, right? Uh, number two, you know it's going to be a bad day when you put your pants on backwards and they fit better. <laughs> Can I have an Amen. Number three, you know it's going to be a bad day when your horn goes off accidentally and remains stuck as you follow a group of hell's angels down the freeway. Yeah, you, you don't want that to happen. Number four, you know it's going to bad, be a bad day when you sink your teeth into a nice juicy steak and they stick. That's, that's a problem. Now, this one's happened to me. You know what's going to be a bad day when you see the 60 Minutes news team waiting in your office. Yeah, that's, that's no fun. That's no fun. Uh, number six, you know what's going to be a bad day when your teenager calls and says he has a little bad news regarding your new car. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And finally, number seven, you know what's going to be a bad day when your grandson says, Grandpa? Did you know it's almost impossible <laughs> to put a grapefruit down the toilet? <laughs> almost. Almost impossible. All right. Well, <laughs> just a little light humor <laughs> for all of us. Well, hey, bad days happen, right? And, and we, the problem is we don't always respond joyfully, do we? We don't always live joyful lives. And so I thought this morning... It might be appropriate to ask ourselves the question, you know, what are the joy stealers in my life? What are those, those things, those people, those circumstances, those places that tend to just rob me of my joy? You know, you know the Apostle Paul wrote from a Roman prison the words, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. <laughs> I don't know about you, but sometimes I might say, thanks a lot, Paul. Appreciate that. Well, hey, in our study going through the book of Acts, we start to focus now on the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul. And we, when we get to Acts chapter 16, Paul is starting to share the gospel in a city in, in actually Macedonia, kind of northern Greece. It was a Roman colony called Philippi. And I got to tell you, as Paul began to share the gospel of Jesus to these, th these Greeks, these Romans, he had a really bad day. I mean, you think you've had a bad day. We're going to look at this day in the life of the apostle Paul and just wow. But I got to tell you, he responded with joy. And I think the way that Paul responded is a real example and model for all of us when we go through really tough times. So before we get into our passage, let's talk with God. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for another beautiful day. The weather's changing a little bit, and we recognize that uh, you are, are the creator, and the seasons are at your command as is our nation, Lord. We recognize that, uh, that above any political affiliation, above any other affiliation we might have in our lives, ultimately, we define ourselves as your children. 
That's what's number one. That's what's most important. And yet, God, the circumstances of our daily lives do have an effect on us. I pray that this morning we would uh, take a page out of the Apostle Paul's book and learn to be joyful no matter the circumstances we face. In your name we pray. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. Well, in Paul's really, really bad day, he uh, encountered some joy stealers. And they're pretty common to all of us. And the first is this, spiritual evil. Paul encountered spiritual evil. Now, let's get to our passage. If you've got your Bibles or you've got it on your phone app, let's all get to Acts chapter 16. And it begins in verse 16, and it says, as we were going to the place of prayer. Who's the we? Well, that's Luke. Luke, who wrote the book of Acts. This is one of those we passages, which gives us a little bit of insight that our author of the book of Acts, Luke, was with Paul in Philippi during this time. So he says, as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. So here's Paul and Luke and Silas and their party, and they're sharing with these Greeks and Romans about the love and salvation of Jesus Christ, and they, they came upon a slave girl. It says, who had a spirit of divination. That means that she was possessed by an evil spirit who gave her the ability to tell the future. And her owners were making money off their slave girl. Verse 17, she followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God and proclaim to you the way of salvation. That demon had pretty good theology, i got to tell you. (laughs) Right? I mean, what this demon was making this poor slave girl yell out was true, was true. But I don't think it was the message that she was screaming out, you know, these men are telling you about the Most High God. They're going to tell you about the way of salvation. That was true. I just think it started to bother Paul. (laughs) She was probably getting more attention from the crowds than Paul was. And it started to steal his joy. Read on. Look what it says in verse 18. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, irritated, losing his joy, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And because he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world, amen, Amen. that demon came out that very hour. Listen, folks, there's evil in our world. All you have to do is turn the TV on at night, right? That's one of my habits. I watch the world news. And as I'm watching, I'll I'll see uh, Christians that are murdered in Africa for their faith. I'll see drug lords who are recruiting children to, to sell their drugs. I'll see the sex trafficking of minors. I'll learn about senseless acts of violence and gangs and, and, and just blatant racism and brutality. And I got to tell you, it can steal my joy. Has that happened to any of you here? I mean, you watch the news and you're depressed, right? It's like, oh my gosh, this world is going to hell in a handbasket. It's tough. I remember my daughter one time was in the room, and I said, hey, do you want to sit down and watch the news with me? She looked at me. She said, why, Dad? It's so depressing. (laughs) 14-year-old, right? Wisdom from the mouths of babes, right? Yeah. We can also experience uh, spiritual evil as, as we encounter people that are just hostile towards God. I don't know about you, but but I've encountered this uh, as a student. I've encountered this in the workplace. I've even encountered it with relatives. And and that sort of spiritual battle, man, that that can rob you of your joy. It really can. And, And so the Apostle Paul writes in another letter to the Ephesians in chapter 6, verses 10 to 12, he says, Now finally be strong in the Lord. 
and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. What's the armor of God? He goes on to talk about things like the shield of faith, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Be dedicated to these things. Put on the armor of God. Why do we need to do that, Paul? Verse 11, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. That's why. That word schemes in the Greek is methodius, his methods. Satan and his demonic forces have figured out how he can bring children of God down. Listen, if you're a follower of Jesus, I hate to tell you, you've got a target on your back. And Satan wants to bring each and every one of us down. And he'll use whatever weaknesses we have, whatever, uh, it, whatever tools are at his disposal to tempt us, to discourage us, to rob our joy. It goes on and it says in verse 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Church, <laughs> it's not just about Democrats and Republicans. It's just not a fight with your boss at work or your teacher at school or your next door neighbor. It's more than that. Paul says, no, we wrestle against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Beware of the spiritual battle that's going on. That could be while you're having such a hard time uh, experiencing joy in your life. There's, there's a second common joy stealer, and that's the selfishness of others. So we go back to our story in the book of Acts, and Paul has exercised this demon out of her. And it tells us in verses 19 and 21, But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews. There was some anti-Semitism going on here. Paul and Silas probably stood out like sore thumbs in the city of Philippi. These men are Jews, and they're disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. What a bunch of hooey. Listen, here's what's going on. The owners of the slave girl are mad because they can't make any money off her anymore. They could care less about what Paul was talking about. Their pockets were going to be empty now because the demon was gone and the slave girl couldn't tell people's fortunes anymore. These people were selfish. These people were abusive. These people were taking advantage of a helpless slave girl. And in their selfishness, they grabbed Paul and Silas. And in their anger, and they, and they brought them uh, uh, before the government leaders of Philippi. And all they could think of was, well, they're talking about this Jesus who's supposed to be the Son of God. That's not okay. That's unlawful for us Romans to practice. And I think what was behind that is if you were a Roman, you worship Caesar. There was a thing called emperor worship at that time. So that was the best Defense that they could give to the local magistrates. Listen, the selfishness of others can definitely be a joy stealer, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but I've experienced it. I've had selfish neighbors steal my joy. Stuff over trash cans and where you park your RV, all right? You know, uh, I've had selfish teammates who hog the ball steal my joy. I've had selfish classmates who cheat and wreck it for the rest of us, steal my joy. I've had coworkers who manipulate the boss and get promoted over me, steal my joy. I've had relatives who are selfish, steal my joy, and I'm not even gonna get into that, all right? There's a third common joy stealer, and that's our circumstances. Our circumstances can steal our joy. So 
back to our story with Paul. We pick it up in verse 22. So Paul and Silas are standing there before the magistrates of Philippi, and they are being accused of promoting other gods, practices that aren't lawful for good Romans to practice. And it says in verse 22, then the crowd joined in, in attacking Paul and Silas. And the magistrates tore their garments off them. They took their clothes off of Paul and Silas in public. Think about this. And they gave orders to beat them with rods. Wow. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. You think you've got some tough circumstances? You think you've had a bad day? Man, have you ever gone through something like that? When you're out sharing your faith at the club or at the park, you ever been beaten with rods for that? Paul did. He was bruised. He was bloodied. And then they threw him into the inner prison. In a lot of those prisons, in those times, in Roman prisons, there were three different levels. And the inner prison was um, the, the one that was farthest underground. And it wasn't lit. And it was damp. It was dark. The air was stale. And that's the, where they threw Paul and Silas and put their feet in wooden, wooden stocks so they couldn't move, basically, or, or go anywhere. Man, I think Paul and Silas could have easily allowed those circumstances to completely rob them of their joy, of their faith. They might want to blame God. Man, what's going on? I mean, let me ask a question. You know, how do you respond? And, and I ask it of myself. How do I respond uh, to unfair treatment or to difficult circumstances in my life? Maybe when you're sick or when people have taken advantage of you or when you're facing a crisis of some sort. Or maybe your kids are in trouble or, or you've had problems at work or your finances are just so tight or, or you've experienced failure. You know? came across a letter that a, that a college girl wrote to her mom and dad as she was away at college. And I, hey, you know, how would you respond to this? Okay, a little on the lighter side, but she says this. Dear mom and dad, I'm sorry to be so long in writing, but unfortunately, all my stationery was destroyed the night our dorm room caught fire by the demonstrators. I'm out of the hospital now, and the doctors say my eyesight should return sooner or later. The wonderful young man, Bill, who rescued me from the fire, kindly offered to share his little apartment with me until my dorm was rebuilt. He comes from a good family, so you won't be surprised, Mom, when I tell you that we're going to be married. In fact, since you've always wanted a grandchild, you'll be glad to know that next, one, next month, you'll be a grandparent. How would you like to get a letter like that, Mom and Dad? But then on the bottom of the letter, it said, Okay, Mom, take a deep breath and disregard this letter. There was no fire. I haven't been in the hospital. I'm not pregnant. I don't even have a steady boyfriend. But I did get a D in French and an F in chemistry. And I wanted to be sure you receive this news with the proper perspective. <laughs> I love that. I'd kill my own daughter if I got that letter, but I love that. That's, that's good stuff. Wow. Well, you know, there's always a different way to look at our circumstances, right? You know, the book of James tells us very familiar words. In James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, James says, count it all joy, brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds, everything from being persecuted and beaten and imprisoned for your faith to trials in your relationships or in your, your job or career or schooling or marriage or whatever that might be. Count it all joy 
when you meet these various kinds of trials, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Now, I don't know about you, but all these things can test my faith in different ways. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Well, as we uh, turn the corner now in the message, as we continue now to look at the way that Paul and Silas responded to what was going on, how they had been treated by the Philippians, they give us a model and an example for a better response when we have those tough days those difficult circumstances. And the first thing is to choose joy because God is in control. Learn to choose joy because ultimately, no matter what happens, let me say that again, no matter what happens, our God is in control. And when we put our faith in our God, we can choose to respond joyfully. We really can to whatever happens. So how did Paul and Silas respond? Well, they're in that prison, and it's dark, and they're tired, and they're exhausted, and they've been beaten many times by rods, and I'm sure they're bruised, and there's probably cuts and blood all over their body, and maybe they might have even suffered a concussion. Who knows? And their feet, they're lying on the ground in mud probably or cold stone. And their feet are in these wooden stocks. Very uncomfortable. They're probably hungry and thirsty. They probably had every right to look up to heaven and say, okay, okay God, I'm out. This is enough. I didn't sign up for this. But No. Look what it says in verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. They were having their own vintage praise service right there in the prison, okay? They were singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Wow. That's just amazing to me. You see, Paul and Silas understood that God was in control. Of everything. He was in control of the government of Philippi, of, of the people that rose up, the mob against them, of the soldiers that beat them. God was in control. And they responded with joy. They chose to respond joyfully through prayer and singing hymns. They were worshiping God in the innermost prison cell. And the other prisoners were listening. Man. Verse 26. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And we understand how that might feel because we all live in California, right? And immediately all the doors were opened. And everyone's bonds were unfastened. Isn't that great? I love it. God's like, I heard your prayers. You're singing praise. Here's another test. All the doors open up. Everybody's chains falls off them. Tell me there's no God, right? Tell me there's no God. And <laughs> verse 27, so the jailer, he wakes up and He's looking around. The, the earthquake shook him. He, he sees all the prison doors are open and, and, and all the, 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 the chains are off the prisoners. So what does he do? He draws his sword ready to kill himself. Why? Because if you were a Roman guard and your prisoners escaped, your punishment was death. So he was just going to take matters into his own hands and just take himself out. All right? Man. Man. Verse 28, but Paul, the apostle Paul cries out with a loud voice, don't harm yourself, we're all here. Paul had every opportunity to say, thank you, Lord. Come on, guys, follow me. Another prison break. 
We talked about one last week. We got one this week, okay? <laughs> Follow me, guys. God just gave us a great escape. Let's go. Paul didn't do that. He sees this poor jailer getting ready to kill himself. And he yells out, don't harm yourself. We're all here. Wow. And the jailer called for the lights. He rushes in and he's trembling with fear. And he fell down before Paul and Silas. He couldn't believe that they had stayed in their prison cells and didn't run off into freedom. And that made him tremble. These men chose to respond with honor and joy. <laughs> even though their circumstances were just terrible. I've been in this uh, new house that we bought maybe six or seven months, and um, I needed a closet kind of remodeled. And so uh, a man in our church came over uh, yesterday and came to, to check it out. And he was looking at the job, and he said, yeah, this is, this is no problem. This is no problem. And I said, well, you know, how, how much do you think it'll cost? And he looked at me, and he said, Pastor, this, this is for you. Don't worry about it. I couldn't believe it. And here's what you don't know. As we were talking about it, he started to share his story. And, and this man has um, his left leg is amputated from below the knee, and he has a prosthetic. And he said... Um, you see, what happened is when I was growing up, my family was, was too poor um, to have milk. So when I got a job and I had my own money, I just drank and drank and drank milk and ended up having a very serious cholesterol problem. And that's how I lost my left foot, part of my leg. And then he said, um, he said, and then I had a stroke. It makes him hard. It's hard for him to talk. But he said, you know what, Pastor, it could be a lot worse I could have had my leg amputated above my knee. Those are the people that I feel sorry for. It's really hard when you get it amputated above the knee, but mine's below the knee. I'm okay. I can walk around. He goes, man, I just, I've been so blessed by the Lord, and it's such a, such a privilege to be able to help you out with this closet. And I'm looking at this man just thinking, my gosh. His circumstances are so difficult. He just lost his mother last month. And yet, he wants to bless me. And he's smiling and telling me how blessed he is from the Lord. I think if my friend here can choose to be joyful, and Paul can choose to be joyful, so can I. Maybe you can too. And we can agree with Paul's words in Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always, always. Again, I say, rejoice. The second response that's better is to find strength in the joy of the Lord. Find strength in the joy of the Lord. You know, joyless people, I've found, they lack power. They lack power in their faith. They lack power in their relationships. They lack power in their marriage. They lack power at school, at work, life itself. They just lack power when there's no joy. And so the Bible reminds us that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Amen? Amen. Nehemiah was a, a leader of the Jews, and, and, and because of their sin, God allowed Israel and Jerusalem to be sacked, and, and they were hauled away to Babylon for years. And then God used Nehemiah and Ezra the prophet, and they led the children of Israel back to the promised land. And they were rebuilding the walls, and they found the law of the Lord again, and were getting reacquainted with their God, and Nehemiah reminded them, the joy of the Lord is your strength. What does that mean? What's the joy of the Lord? What gives the Lord joy? You know what the answer is? <laughs> you. 
you and me. We're God's children, and he takes joy in us. Man, you love your kids? God loves you. You're his kids, and he takes joy in us. He takes joy in our salvation, in our worship. God takes joy in our gratitude, in our obedience, in our service, in our ministries, in our love for one another. God takes joy in us. And that, knowing that, can provide us with strength to make it through whatever circumstance we deal with in life. The Apostle Paul understood this. And he experienced the joy of the Lord all the time. And he then tapped into that strength in this Philippian jail. So look at verse 30. The jailer is kneeling down before Paul and Silas, trembling in fear. And he says this, and he must have heard Paul, what Paul was preaching. And he says in verse 30, he brought Paul and Silas out of the prison and he said, Sirs, What must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? God was getting a hold of his heart. Now, right at that moment, they could have said, you know what? We're not in the mood to share with you anything, Mr. Jailer. Matter of fact, that jailer could have been one of the guys that beat Paul and Silas senseless with those rods. They could be feeling their bruises and their cuts. And this guy says, what do I do to be saved? And they could have said, you know what? We're done here. We're going to go. Good luck, Philippi. Good luck, jailer. They didn't do that. They chose joy. And they found strength in the joy of the Lord to share. And they said in verse 31, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. You and your entire household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. They had a Bible study, folks. (laughs) black eyes, maybe concussion, bloodied. All right, jailer, household, everybody, come on, let's have a Bible study. Let me tell you about Jesus. And then afterwards, maybe some punch and cookies, all right? They have a Bible study, okay? It's awesome. They had the strength to share. And then the, the jailer, verse 33, took them that same hour of the night, and he washed their wounds, and then he was baptized at once, he and his whole family. Then the jailer brought Paul and Silas and their whole party probably up into his house and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Isn't that awesome? I just want to say awesome, Lord, awesome. What a story. What a demonstration of joy despite difficult circumstances. What a demonstration of the power of God. No matter what, God can work. Man, remember when we went through the the book of Philippians just a couple months ago? Paul wrote that letter to a small church in Philippi 10 years after this happened. You know who I think received that letter from Paul? that we call Philippians, I think the jailer and his household were part of that that early church in Philippi. And a woman named Lydia, and maybe even that slave girl whom Paul exercised the demon from. God was working. Church, I want to encourage you. If you're feeling exhausted or discouraged, I get it. Depressed, Maybe cynical, defeated. Maybe you feel hopeless, you're just ready to give up. Listen, I want to remind you, we were created for the joy of our salvation in the Lord, despite our circumstances. Church, choose joy. Choose joy. And in everything, rejoice in the Lord and receive his strength.